Hello everyone, welcome to Woman-Owned Small Business Federal Certification Training. Today our topic is how to ensure your WSB certification is ready for federal contracts. This training is sponsored and brought to you by FedBiz Exchange at FedBizExchange.com. So I'm Michelle Brown. I will be your trainer today. Uh, you can see my information right here in Brown at FedBizExchange.com. After training, I will be sending you some information with some attached documents that I discussed during the training. So feel free to contact me if you need to. So let me just talk to you about uh, who we are before we get started with training very quickly. Some of you have been in training with me. Some of you haven't. Uh, we do train all over the country nationwide, but FedBiz Now and FedBiz Exchange uh, are a, a business development company focused on helping small businesses to accelerate growth in different ways. And we help you through training and development. Uh, this training that we're doing right now is part of that initiative. So we teach small businesses nationwide how to consistently look for ways and to consider new ways to grow your business, uh, whether it's through federal contracting or other types of streams of income. But we want you to be profitable and sustainable. We know that a lot of times you don't have the time to do the research and uh, we want to make it easy for you and support you through these processes. So primarily, we do this in three ways. One of them we're talking about today right now is we do it through federal education. So we have a whole federal buyer contracting training series that we're putting on right now that started actually in late September. And then we have general business education, which also includes a podcast that I will make you familiar with. I'll tell you some of the things that you need to do to stay uh, in connection with us and to help you get all of the free information and education that you need to support you through your growth and through your uh, through your efforts for your company. And then the third way is we have a very serious B2B uh, initiative going on right now. And actually, that is direct through our program called FedBiz Exchange. And I will talk to you about that. We'll have some classes on that. But it's just another initiative to help you do business with other businesses and another initiative to help you uh, grow your company and add other streams of income to your business. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, I'll help you to understand the program. So if you hear me mention the B2B exchange, that's the third way uh, that we help you by connecting you to other businesses so that you can get new customers, whether they're in the same state with you or around the country. So today we're here to talk through and talk about how to ensure that your WSB and EDWOSB certification is ready for contracts. And the reason that's the title is because, believe it or not, we have a very serious problem with women-owned businesses not understanding that their certifications are not done correctly. They're not in the system correctly. There are some things that have changed over the past uh, five years. The program has been in existence for um, a little more than five years now. We trained a couple of thousand people uh, years ago when it first came out. But since a lot has changed, um, it's not so drastic, but it's simple things that could make you be disqualified if you win a contract and your certification is not set up properly. So that's why we need to make sure that you guys are okay, get you set up properly first, and then have you start bidding on some of the contracts that are set aside for women and uh, economically disadvantaged owned woman-owned businesses as well. We have three main objectives today for this training. One, we need to help you to understand in summary what the WOSB and EDWOSB is and how it works. For the most part, you know what it is, but a lot of people still forget why they have the certification and they're definitely not using it right. 
if they were using it right, we'd probably have more bids out there because you have to help the process work. When we're not bidding on WSB contracts and EDWSB contracts, it's not working. And it's not the system that's not making it work. It's us as women-owned businesses that are not taking advantage of the process, which makes it uh, appear to be not important to the woman-owned business community, specifically the woman-owned small business community. And then two, WOSB and EDWOSB eligibility, how you and your company qualify. And three, the certification process itself. You know, uh, we need to make sure that you organize your paperwork and your documents that you prepare and then you submit the appropriate paperwork. You answer the questions correctly and everything is in the system correctly so that when the contracting officer decides that he wants to award you a contract, all of your information is in the system and you will not have any issues. And then I have this small note at the bottom to remind you that some of these things have changed. The NAICS codes that are connected to the WSB program has changed. And when I say that, some of the NAICS code categories have been combined. It doesn't matter which ones, it just means that you need to check the codes for your industry to ensure that your information is correct in your documentation and also in your SAM. So the program itself, um, let's talk about first how to use this tool. So the training uh, will have for you a recorded session so you can listen to this over again if you need to. Uh, you can give it to one of your employees to manage the process, which a lot of you are very busy. You don't have time to do this. You have someone that you trust. It's okay to allow them to listen to this. If you know of other women that need the information, please feel free to share uh, this recording and the documentation. We want as many women as possible to get this done correctly so that we can start winning some of these millions and millions of dollars uh, set aside for women in federal contracts. And then set aside the time or give the person that you want to do the uh, certification that you want to set it up for you, give them the time to do it. You can't do it haphazardly. This is why certifications are not getting done properly. And it's not just WOSB, it's other certifications as well. But you have to set aside the time to do it. And then if you have any questions or concerns, you can actually contact me directly. I don't mind. Yes, I'm as busy as everybody else, but I welcome you to contact me and ask me questions. Uh, and most people are comfortable with email. So you can send me an email with questions or concerns, uh, or you can contact the SBA at sba.gov. Also, uh, there are other documents that will be attached uh, because I will send a follow-up email to all of you that are attending this training so that you can have this presentation itself, and then you can also have the recorded session as well as the NAICS codes that were posted uh, and that are brand new, by the way, uh, in 2016. Actually, what they've done is add more codes to WOSB and EDWOSB. So they still have the codes from before, but you need to check to make sure that you have documented the right codes for your SAM account. And then your WOSB handbook. You really need to have this information handy just in case you ever have questions, but I'm pretty much teaching you everything today that's in the handbook. You should also note that contracting officers have a handbook with instructions on how to handle WOSB federal certifications uh, and uh, what they should look for if they award you a contract. Now, you should keep in mind that contracting officers, sometimes they have so much on their plate they may miss something or they may ask you how to handle it. And just so that you know, contracting officers will be required to go into your account with your permission, look at your documentation. Once they've awarded you a contract, they'll look at your documentation to make sure that everything that you've declared in your certif certification is true. They will also confirm that you are in SAM 
and that you have the appropriate documentation in SAM as well as your NEICS codes. They must follow the rules and the regulations. And if you do not have those things in your SAM, then they'll have to pull the contract from you and you don't want that to happen. And we do know of women-owned businesses that that has happened to. So this training is broken down into two parts, uh, two separate videos. So we've decided that sometimes we try to give you guys too much at once, but if we break it down and make it more manageable, it's much better that way. And I know it's that way for me. I have so many things that I need to focus on and learn that sometimes I realize that if I would just break it down in sessions and learn this part, part one, two, and three, even if the company doesn't have it broken down that way, the company that I'm training for and with, I can do that myself. So we decided that it's much better to do it this way. So this WSB training is broken down into two parts. Part one will cover the eligibility, the program itself, how it works. And it's it's a high level, but it's the important things that you need to understand about your certification as a WOSB or EDWSB. And then in part two, we walk you through the actual application process. And that would cover the three objectives that we just talked about. So part one, the WSB application process, uh, the program summary, the advantages, the eligibility, the regulation, and how it works. That's part one. We're going to discuss that part first. So how does the WOSB and the EDWOSB program work? So here's an overview. The WSB program, and by the way, it started in 2011. I remember that day uh, specifically because I was waiting for the program to come on board. I remember when President Obama announced that it was going to happen two months before it happened, and we were in the field. Uh, it became live, or it went live, I should say, February, February 4th of 2011. So the program actually authorizes federal contracting officers to set aside contract opportunities specifically for and solely for women-owned businesses that are in this program. Not any old type of woman-owned business, but a WOSB, a woman-owned small business, and an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. There is a difference. So I'm very specific about that because I do not think that people understand that there are some differences in just being a woman-owned business and a woman-owned small business. So the government, the federal government, has a mandate and regulations that state that 23% of all federal contracting dollars, and not just contracting dollars, but prime, meaning not as a subcontractor, but we're talking women-owned businesses and uh, disadvantage, disadvantaged women-owned businesses getting contracts as primes, meaning you're the big guy. And it doesn't have to be a big contract. It doesn't have to be anything scary, but it means that you're not a subcontractor. You are the go-to business. You, the, as the CEO of your company, a contracting officer can come to you directly and say, you know, we need A, B, and C, and we want you to be the head of that contract. And not to say that I'm against at all subcontracts, but if you want to grow your company seriously, you should be trying to understand how to do and how to become a federal prime, which is what we're talking about. And by the way, that's the purpose of federal certifications is to teach you how to be a prime, to get you the experience that you need so that you're not always chasing the big guys to get a piece of the action. You're getting a piece of the action directly from the owners of the contract, directly from the federal agencies. So 23% of all contracting do dollars at a federal level must be uh, awarded to small businesses. 5% of that must be awarded to women. Okay, so they're looking for the opportunity to work with you. 
And if they're not, they're supposed to be. And if they're not, you need to find them. This is why you need to do your side of the, of the, of the work because it's, it's a two way street. And when you have both parties, you know, going down a two way street, you end up meeting. But if, if they're doing their part and we as women owned businesses are not doing our part, then it doesn't help. We don't see our women owned businesses getting the contracts if you guys are not doing your part. And doing your part means getting the certification right, means bidding on the contracts, means responding to the contracting officers when they put the opportunities out there. And then bullet point number three wants you to understand that the SBA is in charge of all of this. The SBA is in charge of protecting you in this program, in charge of making sure that you truly are eligible. They could go into your account or they could pull some accounts and do some eligibility checks. That is happening now. It wasn't for a while, but it is now. And you could also have your WSB certification pulled that way if your documentation and your certification is not set up properly. There is no time limit on the program. You can participate as long as you qualify under the program guidelines. And when I say program guidelines, I'm talking as long as you are a small business declared through your SAM and your numbers for your NAICS codes do not exceed what the government says you should be or where you should be, you know, revenue wise on an annual basis, as long as you are under that threshold hold or at that threshold, you are still considered a small business. Meaning if the government says under your NAICS codes, you are in, um, let's say engineering, your engineering codes state that you can only make up to $10 million annually and still be considered a small business. Anything over, the, over that takes away your small business status. As long as you don't go over your number that way, you can still and continue to participate in the program. You must also update your documents and your status annually, meaning you just need to upload anything that changes and you need to make sure that anything that has a date on it, that um, it hasn't expired or something like that. If you make changes to your company, your LLC or your corporation, you need to make sure that you change that information. If you're using a passport that has expired or could possibly expire, you need to make sure that that's updated and changed. And when you're out there bidding, make sure that when you're bidding, that you go back in, check your certification, make sure everything is good. Check SAM, make sure everything is good. So that if you get a contract, which you very well could, you get a contract, you don't have to worry about anything. So the Woman Owned Small Business Federal Contracting Program, it actually promotes competitiveness, but not necessarily just some among WOSBs and EDWOSBs. It promotes competitiveness for industry specific um, federal contracts. So with your WOSB, you have to use certain NAICS codes. You may be using five or six or 10 NAICS codes. Not all of them are going to be WOSB or EDWSB. Uh, so you need to understand the difference. You can keep those codes, which I encourage you to do because you could get other contracting opportunities through a small business period. So uh, we just have to understand to participate in the program for certification under WSB and EDWSB, we must have the right NAICS codes. So the competitiveness comes about when we are thinking about how do women compete with other small businesses? You know, how do we help women get ahead when it comes to the competition, uh, when it comes to women competing with all of the other small businesses in the uh, federal contracting community. The way that we do that is we choose these codes. The contracting officer knows about these codes. Everybody does. They put contracts and contra contracting opportunities specifically under the WOSB codes so that only women can compete. There will be no male-owned companies. It's all about women, 
period. So if you are a woman and you are certified and you see a set-aside opportunity for WOSB or EDWSB, that's for you. So what that does is it limits a lot of the competition. Your situation becomes more doable. You can compete now because you are competing with other women-owned businesses. And is it true that some women-owned businesses might be, you know, have way more revenue than you? Yes, that's possible. But because you're getting this education and you're trying to learn how to use it, you would be surprised at when they set aside something, how limited your competition is. It really does help. But again, we have to use it. So the impacts of the WSB program would be the fact that women can compete and women can win. Women can actually win these federal contracts when they do it this way. When they take out or carve out these contracts just for women, it's easier for you to win. But you have to bid and you have to do what it takes. Number two, it gives the contracting officer a tool so that they can meet their goals as well. That 5%, they have to think about, okay, I have this 5% goal on my back. Uh, how do I meet that? Well, this is an easy way for them to meet it. They can take some of their contracting opportunities and set them aside just for women to compete. And they can meet their goals much faster and easier that way. And remember, they have to do that every year. And then number three, WSBs, you automatically, whether you're an ED or WSB, regular WSB, this is a huge opportunity for you to grow your company. That's why it's important for you to understand how all of this works. The more you know, the better you can utilize the system and you can get some of those multi-million dollar contracts. So a contracting officer can set aside a requirement. And just so that you know, when you see the term requirement, a requirement is an opportunity. It's a contract. They can set aside the requirement uh, for WOSB and EDWOSB if that NAICS code matches uh, what's in the document that I'm going to show you. They can only set aside under specific codes under WSB codes and under EDWOSB codes. And it'll say when you're doing your search for bids, and, and we have training on that actually uh, in a couple of weeks, so you will see what I mean. It'll say WOSB, but there are some situations where you may see it set aside just as a regular small business. It may be one of your WOSB codes, but it's not set aside as a WOSB. I will talk to you about how to get that set aside as a WOSB or how to encourage that so in the future you can get more set asides as a WOSB. But you have to be consistent. You have to bid. You have to let them know that you're out there. And speaking of letting them know that you're out there, look at number two. The contracting officer has to have a reasonable expectation that two or more or more WOSBs will submit an offer. Now, they call that the rule of two. That is not um, a hard and fast rule anymore. Now, all they have to see is one. They don't have to see two. They can see one and make the decision. And uh, there are some really, really strong, encouraging women in Washington that actually uh, looked at this certification. If it wasn't for a lot of women like that, women in politics getting this done, it wouldn't be done. Uh, and uh, again, it was done under President Obama, and it was a great time for them to do it. But they actually encouraged the um, the changes in regulation to get this rule of two to not go away, but to um, actually not be the deciding factor for a contracting officer to set aside. So if you're the only one in your industry, because your industry is, is extremely, substantially underrepresented, it is to your advantage to do some marketing to let the contracting officers know that you're out there, even if they don't respond to you. Because when they know you're out there and they're looking for women, they have your capability statement. It's, it's out there already.
So keep that in mind. So that's, if you hear it, it's the rule of two. But you can also say to the contracting officer, well, I don't know if there are two, but I know I'm here. And I was told that you do have the authority to set aside, even if you know that there is just one. The reason that they say two is because they want to create some level of competition. But trust me, they can set aside something for WSB or EDWSB, and there could be only one person to respond. And I've seen where one person responds, one person gets the bid, or five people could respond. It doesn't matter. If you do your part, you're upping your chances to get the contract. And then three, the anticipated award price of the contract does not exceed if you are in manufacturing 6.5 million and if you are in any other type of business that is not considered manufacturing up to 4 million. So those are some nice size awards, but that's just to say that they don't want to limit women. All you need is a couple of those. Some of you don't even care if you get a couple of those. You're you're willing to at least go for a half a million or 250 or 30,000 here, 50,000 there. But the fact of the matter is, you do a few of those 30,000 here, 25,000 there. Next thing you know, it could be a 4 million or if you're in manufacturing, which we do have a few uh clients that are in manufacturing up to 6.5 million. Then four, the contract must be awarded at a fair and reasonable price. Now, I will tell you, there are some regulations under the Small Business Act that allow contracting officers to give you a little bit of leeway on price. Every single thing is not done on price, but you will hear a lot in the federal arena that everything is all about price. It is not. Not all the time. And if your pricing is a little bit higher, you can ask the contracting officer. If Let's say you don't win the bid and you do a debrief and they say you did everything great. It was just your pricing. You should talk to them about that pricing. Let them know that, you know, you are a small business. These guys don't think the same way we do. They're government. They're not commercial business people. So you have to have all of the information. You have to be knowledgeable. You can educate them. You think they sit up reading the FAR and the regulation all day? No, they don't. They don't read it any more than you do. The only thing that they know is what they have to have. They know you have to be in SAM. They know some of the regulations by heart. Some of them are very, very experienced, but a lot of them are not that experienced. And remember, they're not just dealing with the WSB program. They're dealing with all types of certification programs They're dealing with regular businesses, large businesses. They have so much on their plate. So you need to be able to defend your pricing. So if your pricing is just a little bit higher, I would try to stay less than 10%. But if your pricing is a little bit higher, the contracting officer can take it. They have to want to help you and want to support you, but you need to be in a position to defend it. And most of the time you can't compete with a small business that is a $15 million company when you are a half a million dollar company, but yet you may be able to do a better job. This may be your big break. So you need to position yourself. You need to understand why your pricing is a little bit different and you need to be able to represent why your pricing may be a little bit higher. And you need to understand that The contracting officer has the authority to make that change and to accept your pricing, even if it's not the cheapest. So this is actually an SBA little chart that they put together. They just put everything together. They want you to remember that everything is based on your NAICS codes. Okay. And then the rule of two is how the contracting officer has a um, his decision process, his or her decision process. Generally, what they're thinking is, well, if there are two or more women out there, then I could set this aside and I will have women to bid on it. Because if they can find two, then more than likely there are more. Now, from your personal perspective, you don't care if there are more or not. But we need to get them believing that there is competition out there in the women own small business arena. Okay. 
And remember, if you are an EDWOSB, you are also a WOSB. EDWOSBs can bid on WOSB contracts, but WOSB opportunity, or I should say WOSB certifications, uh, people that are just WOSB cannot bid on EDWOSB opportunities. So let me say that again. EDWOSB is considered a WOSB, so they can bid on any WOSB contract, any EDWSB contract. On the other hand, WOSBs are only WOSBs and they can only bid on WOSB contracts. Okay? So, and then they talk about the award price and then they remind you that you need to make sure that you're looking at the most recent NAICS codes. So, Speaking of, here are the WOSB codes, and of course this is just a snapshot, but if you get a follow-up email from me because you went to the live training, you will be getting a copy of this um, most updated 2016 list of NAICS codes for WOSB. So if you're WOSB, you should use this list because they are different. If you are an EDWOSB, you must use this list that says Economically Disadvantaged Women-Owned Small Businesses 2016 NAICS Codes. Okay. Also, keep in mind that if you are an EDWOSB, you can also add WOSB codes because remember, EDs can do both. If you are a regular WSB, you cannot do both. So if you have any questions about that, because that can be a little bit confusing, please you know, write to me or give me a call, and I'll be happy to explain it. And we can look at what your codes are. So requirements for WSB also, and EDWSB also includes sole source authority contracts. Now, this is brand new. What that means is when someone gets a sole source contract, it just means that the government, whoever the contracting officer or agency is, it means that they have not been able to find any other source except this one. There are some people that get that call where uh, a federal contracting officer is doing a lot of research. They come about a person, they're doing their market research, and they find one company that does what they need. It happens all the time. That's what a sole source contract is. But what if it is a woman-owned business sole source contract? That happens too. We didn't have this before. This is new over the last couple of years. So here's what the contracting officer has to think about. Is the contract or the need, the requirement, the opportunity, is it WOSB eligible or EDWOSB eligible by NAICS code? You have to answer that question. That answer must be yes. Is the contract, including the options, valued at $6.5 million or less for manufacturing or $4 million or less for all of the other types of contracts? Can the contract be awarded to a WOSB at a fair and reasonable price. So, you know, of course, you don't want your price to be over 10%, 15%, but could it be, you know, a few points over, a couple of percentages point, points over? Yeah, it could be. And that's still fair. So who's to determine what fair is? It may not be 10% over. It may not be 15 But you, again, can demonstrate why your pricing is fair and they can still choose you. So don't don't put yourself in a hole because you're trying to compete. They don't want that either. They want you to be a success if they award you the contract. And number four, bullet point four, in the determination of the contracting officer, is there a reasonable expectation that there's only one woman-owned business, one woman-owned small business that can perform? Those are the questions they have to ask themselves. And if the answer is yes to each one of those, then they can award a sole source contract. And sometimes you will see 
uh, in some of the bidding uh, platforms or on some of the bidding platforms where they do a justification. Sometimes they have to justify why they're giving a contract as a sole source to one entity, especially to guard against uh, protest meaning other people complaining that they did not get the opportunity. So WOSB and EDWSB program eligibility. This is important because if you're not eligible and they find out you're not eligible, then you could get into some serious trouble. So we need to make sure you're eligible. But first, before we go into eligibility, I do want to talk to you about what a WOSB is versus a WOB. So a business owned by a woman, a WOB, is not the same as a WOSB. Oh, a WOSB is a woman-owned small business. A, WOSB, a, a WOB is just a business owned by a woman. It's not a small business necessarily. You could be a WOB and be a small business, but for the purpose of this program, you must be small. That's why it's called WOSB which also includes EDWOSB. There can be a huge difference between the two, so pay attention. That's why I have to walk through the eligibility with you. So there are many non-eligibility standards for a regular woman-owned business. A regular woman-owned business may not meet the standards or requirements for being WOSB certified. And I've seen it happen. I've seen situations where there are husbands and wives that are in business together. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to do a WOSB certification, the husband truly needs to give up the power to the wife. And it needs to be legitimate, meaning you have to do the paperwork on it. The percentages have to be 51% for the woman, 49% percent for everyone else or the male person or whoever the other folks that are involved. But the woman has to own 51 percent. In a woman-owned business, that's not always the same. That's not always the case. I mean, you know, it it, it doesn't, it could be 50-50 and they still call it a woman-owned business. You just never know what people are doing with their LLCs and their corporations. But the government is telling us, if we want to be a part of this program, what we must do. There are, there are some other things with a woman-owned business is that, you know, uh, she must be the decision maker. In other women-owned businesses that are not necessarily small, or even if they are uh, small, maybe maybe the male, maybe there's a male person making the final decisions, or there's a, a higher ranking uh, board over the structure uh, of the company. That Those things are unacceptable. So that's the difference. And I'll give you a good example as with Amazon. Let's say Amazon, they're buying up a lot of stuff, and I'm, of course, making this up, but it could be true. What if Amazon uh, met a woman-owned company and they decided, wow, I really want to invest in this company. I'd like to buy in at 51%. And now Amazon, the parent company of Amazon, owns this company. It is no longer owned by a, a woman, and neither is it maybe considered small because maybe he invested a lot of funding into the business and helped it to grow. Maybe it's exceeding uh, its NAICS code limits for women-owned small business. And so a lot of things have changed. And so if, if this company were questioned uh, with that certification and they're owned by Amazon, they would be ineligible and they could get into some serious trouble. So if you have any changes that happen like that, you need to make sure you correct them or get out of that situation. And when we go through in the next slides, when we go through the eligibility requirements, you must meet all of those requirements. So these standards that I'm going to discuss with you must be met in order for you to participate in the WSB certification program. So to qualify for the set aside program, you must be small. That is one big difference. A lot of women owned businesses are not small. They're over the limit of their NAICS codes when it comes to being small. Uh, there's no minimum amount of time you can be in business. You could quit your job, start a business tomorrow, and you're fine. You could be in the certification program. You, you must, however, 
be full time. You cannot say or tell them that you work a part time job and expect for them to take you seriously as a woman owned small business uh, under this certification program. You must own unconditionally 51 percent. The reason they say unconditionally is because they're talking about situations like I just mentioned to you. No one else can own you unless the the parent company that owns you, unless they are owned uh, solely, that parent company, as, lo as long as it's owned by another a group of women or another woman-owned business. Okay, so it, it must be owned by women directly. No indirect situations are allowed. And it must be controlled by one or more women who are United States citizens. So if you weren't born in this country, you need to make sure your citizenship is in order. Otherwise, you would not qualify for this program. Management decisions and daily operations must be controlled by a woman. You cannot have your husband or a, a male who is considering himself and you considering him more technically competent than you. You don't have to be technically competent. You just need to understand the business. But he cannot tell you what to do. You have to be the decision maker with no hidden influence. A woman must hold the highest office position. So you cannot be the president and your husband be the CEO. That is an unacceptable situation. If that is the way it is at this time, you need to change it. You need to be the CEO and he needs to be the president and you need to change your paperwork to prove that it is in writing and that's how you operate. And make sure that you also have 51%, no 50-50. The woman concerned is not required to hold the technical licenses. I just said that. But when we say that, what we're talking about is if you own a trucking company, and we have some women clients that own trucking companies, both very well-to-do uh, trucking companies. They have lots of experience from over the years, one 15 years, one 13 years, and they do very well. Neither of them have CDL. They're not truck drivers. They could if they wanted to, but they don't have to. So that's what they mean when they say you do not have to hold the technical licenses. I have uh, a client years ago that I helped her with her 8A. I did it personally. I don't do that much anymore. But um, with her 8A, I was the, the key person helping her to get that done. And uh, she owned a plumbing company, her and her husband. Her husband retired. She totally took control of the business. No, she's not a plumber, but she ran all the plumbers and uh, she ran the whole company. The company was 25 years old and she had been working in the company all of those years. She took it over. She was a woman owned business and she was applying for her 8A, woman owned small business, applying for her 8A. An SBA will not apply community property laws when determining ownership. So they, generally speaking, they don't mess with you about, um, you know, what you own with your husband if it makes you go over. However, consider that if they don't believe you or they have reason to doubt that there's some funny stuff going on, they can ask for more documents. They could even ask for your husband to sign a document uh, basically stating that he's not involved in your business that way. And if he is involved in the business, that he uh, does not have more authority than you. He's not making the decisions, all of the things that I just mentioned. So understand that they have the authority to do that. So how is a WOSB determined to be economically disadvantaged? Keep in mind, EDWOSB is a personal choice. And if you have questions about whether or not you should go ahead and become EDWOSB, you should talk to someone like myself that has a business experience when it comes to this, because sometimes Declaring yourself as an economically disadvantaged business, depending on the industry, could hurt you more than it could help you. There are some industries where it could help you a lot, and there are other industries where it could hurt you. Because uh, 
keep in mind, again, you're dealing with government-minded thinking people. They're not business thinking people necessarily. So if you're in the construction business or you're in the trucking business, you know, it may hurt you to be economically disadvantaged. But I can help you with that by running some reports to see, you know, what kinds of companies are getting contracts in your industry and are they very small companies or are they medium-sized companies or are they giving any contracts in your industry to economically disadvantaged women-owned businesses? So you, you need to be very careful about what you decide to do in that area, okay? It's something that you need to think about. Now, I we have uh, a couple of clients that are specialty-type engineers, for them, being economically disadvantaged is actually a plus because there are not a lot of women-owned businesses uh, in those arenas. And they're, and these are specialty type engineers, like an environmental engineer, like an uh, energy engineer. Uh, specialty industries like that, it could be an advantage for you to be economically disadvantaged, especially if you are a woman you are a minority, those could be huge advantages for you because you have to have high education, you have to have a lot of different things in place, but they won't look at you the same way. It's because, you know, they may need to find a woman in that industry. And if they find that woman in that industry, that could be like a needle in a haystack. And that woman in that industry as an economically disadvantaged woman-owned business could very easily qualify for a sole source because, you know, she's very unusual. She's in an unusual situation. So, and remember, that's a professional industry. So they're not looking at her thinking, well, how does she get all of the manpower? How does, does she have to have a lot of um, contracting dollars or a lot of funding? She doesn't have to have any of those things because as an engineer, and as uh, I'm specifically referring to our client who's an energy engineer, she has a huge advantage because all she needs is her professional education and her uh, relationships with other engineers. She doesn't need funding to do those things. Her business is based on time. It's based on strategy. It's based on consultation. So you just need to think about that. But the first thing you need to consider as a WOSB, think considering changing into or adding, because you can apply to be a WOSB first and then later on decide you want to become an EDWOSB because you feel it's to your advantage. You can do that. All you have to do is go back in and make the changes. But the first thing they're going to look at is your personal net worth and your adjusted gross income, your fair market value of your assets. And you do that by filling out what we call a, um, a personal financial statement. Now, that personal financial statement is already built into the uh, WOSB process in the system. So you don't have to fill out a special form. You just need to get your documentation together. But your personal net worth in total has to be less than 750,000 uh, assets minus your liabilities. And if you're not familiar with what a personal net worth statement or a financial statement looks like, it's called a 413. And it would be located at sba.gov. And all you have to do is search for 413. And if I were you, I would fill that out first, just so that I have all of my paperwork ready before I start the WSB process, if you are sure that you want to be an EDWSB. If you decide it later, you can do it later. But just make sure that you go ahead and get that form filled out so that you can answer the questions in the computer system once you begin your WOSB and EDWSB application. And remember, you only do this 413, this financial statement, if you're going to be EDWSB. If you're going to be WSB only, you are not required to do a financial statement. 
So your average income over the last three years cannot exceed 350000 Even some of our wealthiest businesses, when I say wealthy, I mean they're making 15 you know, $20 million a year, they don't even pay themselves, generally speaking, $350,000 a year. Uh, most, I mean, the highest I've seen, even with a $15 million business, is $250,000. Uh, $350,000 is a very nice income. Uh, and most entrepreneurial type people, they put that money back into their business. So a lot of them don't do that. Uh, so this is this could be easy for many of you to to meet this standard where you're not paying yourself. And the seven hundred and fifty thousand in assets, that is based on half of what you share with your husband if you have a spouse or your partner. OK, fair market value of all assets. That means oh, including your residents. Um, or, and it just they just want to make sure you do not exceed six million dollars with your assets, which most people don't. I mean, we even have some people that have a couple million dollars um, invested with their homes, but maybe the home is not paid for. Maybe there's only two hundred thousand uh, in equity in the home. And then, you know, of course, you know, the business, they don't look at the business that way, but they're talking about, uh, you know, everything that you own from a personal level. And remember, everything about certifications is personal. It's not just about your business. It is about you personally. When they talk about disadvantage, they want to make sure that you're not claiming to be disadvantaged, but your husband is a, a you know a multi multi millionaire where he's worth two hundred million dollars. That probably won't look good. So your husband or your mate, your spouse, whoever that may be, it doesn't matter uh, if that person that you are with, living with, or you have access to their income, and they're worth more than six million dollars. That could bring up some questions. Doesn't mean you won't get it. It just means you need to be aware. And then uh, it doesn't include your ownership interest in your business, your WSB or your EDWSB business. So you don't because some people have a very, uh, a very good business and their interest and their equity is worth quite a bit. They are not including that. So you also don't have to include the equity in your primary residence. If your husband or mate owns half of the residence, then they would consider your portion as equity, but you don't even have to include it. And then you will not include income from your LLC or your S Corp. So as you can see, this is a pretty good deal. There's no reason why uh, people should not do this WOSB or as even if you're in a position, especially the EDWOSB. But remember what I said, consider your industry first. IRA accounts are untouchable until retirement, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, the certification process. So let's just talk a little bit about um, going into the certification process, what you need to have set up. So there are two ways to certify as a WOSB or an EDWSB. You can self-certify, which is free. You will hear people tell you, well, they're going to change that. That is true. They're considering changing it and making everybody go through one of the third party administrators, which we are not. We had considered doing that, but we decided it was better to just train women uh, to teach them how to fish. It goes back to that, making sure you understand what you need to do so that you don't have to depend on others. Whenever you hire people, it's a good thing. But even when you hire people to do your work, make sure that you understand what they're doing. Just in case something happens to that relationship or that person's no longer there, you know how to pick it up and take off. So we believe in teaching our clients and our customers how to take care of their own paperwork and how to be uh, make sure that they are legitimate on everything when they're working with the federal government and even the state government. So the first thing you have to do is register in SAM. You do this for both. But if you went through a third party, your procedure is going to be different when you get into the application process. You don't have to do that much. But again, I recommend that you understand what the third party was supposed to do. We still have people that hire us to do WOSBs. We 
we do that, but we walk through the process with them so that they understand what we've done and what has been set up for them if they have to go back in and update. So on the, under the free self-certification, that is still in existence. You can still self-certify. You do not need to use a third party unless you just want to. But for the self-certification, you make sure you're in SAM. You're all there, all of you already, most of you. If you're just getting started and you need to know what it takes to get SAM set up, write to me and I will tell you what to do. Uh, we may even have a free uh, video session on SAM and what you need to do with, with SAM. Uh, number two, you need to compile all of your documents because you have to upload every required document into, we call it the repository because it used to be called the repository. But now that repository has moved over to certify.sba.gov, and I'll show you where that is. And then three, represent status in SAM as a WSB or EDWSB. So you're, the first step you must take is to register in SAM, because if you don't register in SAM, you can't do anything. SAM is the beginning, and I'll talk to you about SAM a little bit more. But SAM creates an account for you in the WSB repository area. So you wouldn't even have an account that could be pulled from SAM if you're not already registered and completed your SAM. And what I mean by number three is a lot of you are represented as WOSBs or EDWOSBs when you didn't even do the certification process correctly. So that's the concern. The concern is, is that a contracting officer could find you talk to you about bidding on something or, or awarding you something and uh, because there's a sole source situation and you think you're set up properly, but he goes to check your documents after wanting to talk to you about getting a contract with you. He goes to check your documents and your full certification and it's not correct because uh, you haven't put all your paperwork in or you don't have the right codes in there. Something could be wrong. So that's why we're walking through this. Now, before I go on, I just want to cover also the fee associated third party certifiers. It's OK to do the third party and they have a list of the third parties. It's only about four. They only allowed us to do the third party certification a few years ago. You had one chance and we decided not to do it. So. They're not talking about giving other organizations a chance to do it, but you do have four entities that do it. Most of them charge anywhere between three and four hundred dollars. But they um, I don't know what their process is, but I would suspect that you already have to be in SAM. I'm pretty sure they don't do SAM for you. SAM, you know, that can take some time to do SAM and you need to pay attention while you're doing that. That could take take a couple of hours. So they probably require you to already be in SAM. If they don't and they do it for you, that's great. I don't think they do, but it would be great if they do. But number two, what they do is like uh, NABO or um, WeBank. Those are two women organizations that they will do the certifications for you. And both of those organizations, they have a certification program anyway for their own organization. So WeBank, some of you know what WeBank is. I think WeBank is a great organization. I like them a lot. I think they bring a lot of positive to the um, woman-owned business community. But they have their own certification process which allows them to work in conjunction with this WOSB certification. And they uh, take a little bit longer. So if you have that done with them, that's fine. Just check on the process. Make sure that everything is up to date and you should be good to go. But for the most part, the government only requires you to put in that certificate from the third party if you used a third party, because the third party told the government, they guaranteed the government that they would check you out and make sure that you really were a woman owned small business. So you just have a certificate that needs to be uploaded in certify.sba.gov. And then number three, represent your status in the WSB or EDWSB. Again, I don't know if the third party does that for you or if you do it yourself once they give you that certificate. You need to find that out. And number four, this is very, very important. If you are an EDWOSB, 
these third party organizations will not do your 413, your financial statement. So if you want to be EDWSB, you need to do your own EDWSB information. So maybe the third party did your WSB portion, but you need to go back into the system and fill out the proper forms to become EDWSB. And if you have any questions about that, you need to write to me or call SBA.gov or uh, get a number and talk to uh, one of the representatives there. But feel free to write to me and, and talk to me about it because that can be kind of confusing. OK, I just want to mention SAM, although most of you know what this is. You already have your information in there. But SAM uh, looks like this. We all know what it looks like and some of us don't. But you need to start here and it is SAM.gov. You cannot do anything else until you start with SAM.gov. Set up an account and walk through the process. You need to set aside about an hour and a half. Now, keep in mind. For those of you that are setting up your certification, you're already set up in SAM. After you're done with your certification, you're going to go back to SAM and update the proper NAICS codes from the NAICS code WOSB and EDWOSB list. Because do you see this down here? This is from the government. You're not supposed to claim that status. And I know a lot of you didn't know that. They don't even tell you that in SAM. There's no way for you to know that. They don't even tell you. So uh, the SBA is telling you, but and I'm telling you, but you really have no way of knowing that. And I've been asked before, where can you locate the area to update the status? There is no shortcut. You must go through the entire update SAM process. That's just the way it is. I've asked a thousand times, are they going to change that? The answer thus far is no. So when you go into SAM, you're going to choose the entity that you want to update that is WOSB because some of you have more than one entity in SAM. You choose the entity that you want to update and walk through the update process. Everything else stays the same except for two places. When you get to your NAICS code, you need to update your NAICS code or codes, and you need to check that you are WOSB again or EDWOSB again. Okay, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when you go back in there. So what is SAM? SAM is the system for awards management. Nobody can do anything without SAM. It is the beginning and the end of federal contracting. It used to be called CCR. Uh, we had that. Some of you may know what that is, but it's just a centralized database that the government uses to manage all the different entities and the contracting and who's who and who's doing what, who's a small business, who's a large business, who's woman owned, who's, you know, who are all these 650,000 businesses that are in this database. That's all it is. But you cannot do anything without it. You cannot bid on any federal contracts without it. So you must be in there. So every bit of the required information about your company is located in SAM. Sometimes you forget things. Maybe you don't remember your MPIN. So go into SAM and find it. Now your MPIN is very private. So you almost have to open it up and go through the process of updating to find your MPIN. M-P-I-N. A lot of you probably don't even pay attention to it. They made you pick a pin. These are the things that you need to write down and keep in a safe place on a separate piece of paper because you will always need those kinds of things. So I've already harped on this, but a lot of WSBs and EDWSBs are not set up properly. And again, SBA says you're out of violation or you're in violation when you're labeled as WSB and you haven't completed the process. So I've already talked about this. Uh, if you haven't completed the process, you need to go in and take it out. Or if you're going to hurry up and complete the process, hurry up and complete that process and go into SAM and update everything as it relates to this WOSB program. Okay, so you need to get this completed right away. These two, number one, 
number two bullet point and number three. I've already repeated this, but I just don't want people to get into trouble because I've seen problems come about. I've seen a $5 million contract be taken away uh, because uh, certification was not done correctly for WOSB. So if the SBA or the contracting officer finds a discrepancy, the contracting officer must report it to the SBA and then the SBA will do an investigation. You'll be removed from the program and it could even affect you bidding on other types of contracts as a small business. Because remember, WSB is not the only way for you to bid on a contract. You can bid on a contract as a small business, period. Or what if you're a veteran? You can bid as a veteran-owned company. Or what if you're 8A? You could bid as an 8A company. So the first thing you need to do before you sit down in step two is you need to gather all of the documents. You need a birth certificate or an unexpired passport for identification. If you uh, are a naturalized citizen, you need your naturalization papers. If you are involved in a joint venture, um, you need for joint venture agreements uh, through your WOSB. You could actually create a WOSB joint venture or an EDWOSB joint venture, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through some of the training uh, under the Federal Buyers Training Program. And then any fictitious or DBA names or certificates that you have, you need to uh, get copies of those. You need to have a signed copy of the WSB certification program. Now, this has changed a little bit. It's now in the system. There is no document like it used to be before. I left this. I left it this way so that some of you, uh, if you have the signed document that you used to use, that is no longer needed. It's no longer requirement. When you walk through the application process, it actually asks you to confirm your signature. Uh, electronically so you don't need this document anymore so I left that in there so that I would not forget to explain the difference and then number six the Fort 13 even though I'm telling you to fill that out get one from SBA.gov and fill it out it's going to ask you all of those questions about how much credit card debt do you have how much is your house worth what is your income um, what else? Uh, it'll ask you all kinds of things. You know, do you own a vehicle or vehicles? Do you have uh, life insurance? Uh, it'll ask you all of those types of things. But I want you to look at the 413 personal financial statement first so that you can prepare. There's nothing worse than sitting down to do one of these and you don't have all the documents. This is why people don't get it done. So you need to prepare. I teach um people how to do it this way so that you're not irritated when you sit down and then you don't finish it because that's what people do. They sit down to complete it and they don't have the right documents. And then your DUNS number. If you don't remember your DUNS number, it's in SAM. You can Google, not, not Google, excuse me, you can go to SAM.gov and um, search your name and get your DUNS number or you can sign in and get your DUNS number. Your EIN number, of course, you probably need to make sure you have that available. All of these things should be on a piece of paper somewhere in a safe place um, in your computer or print it out if you don't want to keep it in your computer. But you should have all of these things, your MPIN, your SAM.gov login, your password, you know, all of these things you have to change on a regular basis, I understand, but uh, at least the passwords. But make sure you have this stuff together before you sit down. Then you need your corporate paperwork. If you are a limited liability company, then you need your articles of organization and any amendments, and you must have an operating agreement. If you do not have an operating agreement, you know what? Either go to LegalZoom or one of those places or something like that or download a, a sample copy and create an operating agreement. You can use a template one. It doesn't have to be anything um, serious where you go to your um, your lawyer to pay thousands of dollars to do it at this time maybe you might do that in the future but if it's just you and you're a small business you should do that 
It's not that big of a deal. However, there are some of you that are larger organizations, but if you're large, you have this already. So if you're an LLC, you need to L put your LLC paperwork, uh, have that available because you're going to put that in the system. If you are a corporation, you must have your articles of incorporation and any amendments. You must have bylaws, which I suggest the same thing. If you don't have any bylaws, create them. You can get a template or go to LegalZoom to, to download uh, a, a, a template and fill it in. Get some legal advice from them. They're very helpful. You can uh, get some issued stock certificates. Those used to be sold in the store and you fill them in in the office uh, max and staple stores, but it's not like that as far as I know anymore. But you also need to create a stock ledger. So, you know, if you can't get these things out of the store anymore, surely you can get them uh, from a legal program in the system or go to a legal store uh, online or a physical legal store. But if you're the only uh, person in the corporation or there are two of you, then you decide how, you know, your bylaws are set up and then the stock, how, you know, does the other person have stock in the company? If they do, of course, you fill out the stock certificates and you fill out the stock ledger. And then partnerships, all you need is a partnership agreement with any amendments. OK, not too many people do partnerships that way anymore. Most people are doing LLCs or corporations. And then even if you're an S corporation, you know, that's a filing status for the IRS. You still need these all of these documents. OK. OK, so this is the end of part one, the part one training video. I will see you in part two training. Thank you for joining me again. I'm Michelle Brown, and I just want to remind you if you're doing this one step at a time, maybe you're doing part one today, you do part two tomorrow, please go and list your business on FedBizExchange.com. It's where small businesses can start doing business big business together. This is a huge initiative for us. We need your support to get you guys doing business with each other. It's called the B2B Exchange and it is fedbiz.com. Thank you for joining me and I will see you in part two, the next video.